Story one of Kafer Kangaroo Klondike Tales of the Gold Fields. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Kafer Kangaroo Klondike Tales of the Gold Fields by Thaddeus William Henry Levitt. Story one A Strange Partner, an Australian Story. When the P&O steamer called at Albany, West Australia, only two passengers came on board, a young Englishman and his wife. Before we reached Sydney, I made his acquaintance in the smoking-room, and he told me the following story. I give it in his own words. My name is Henry Detmold. I was born in Lincolnshire, England, and I am twenty-nine years of age. My parents were of the middle class and gave me a fair business education. When I was eighteen, my father secured me a position in the county bank at a very small salary. There I remained until two years ago. My salary had been increased to eighty pounds a year, and I saw no prospect of an advance for years to come. I had never been out of my native county, save two flying trips, which I made to London for a few days during my holidays. By accident I picked up a copy of the Melbourne Age, in which I read an account of the discovery of gold in Western Australia. The spirit of adventure, so strong in an Englishman's blood, was aroused. I resigned my position and took passage for Sydney. From that point I made my way to Perth, the capital of West Australia. I took passage on the coach for Coolgardie, and during my trip over the desert of sand, which I was compelled to walk, my box only riding on the stage, I more than once came to the conclusion that a situation in a bank at a meagre salary was highly to be preferred to gold-seeking with the thermometer at a hundred and twenty degrees in the shade. Coolgardie was a wilderness of tents and fleas, with absence of water, and what was worse, I discovered that the prospector's country lay still in the interior, but for shame and the knowledge that my position in the bank had long been filled, I would have turned back. In Coolgardie I made the acquaintance of George Vale, a young Australian from Gippsland, who like myself had been attracted to the west coast by the tales of wonderful finds made by the first comers to this land of sand and heat vale was very slight in build and in no wise adapted to roughing it as a miner but such was his charm of manner that he won my sympathies and as we were attracted by our mutual ignorance of our new life and unfitness to cope with the difficulties which hedged us in we soon became inseparable companions and finally decided to strike out for the interior and try our fortunes our last money was expended in the purchase of a mule and provisions enough for a three months trip the mule was to carry the provisions while we were to trudge alongside on foot with swags strapped to our backs we turned our faces towards the east and bid good-bye to coolgardie fifty miles inland found us in the most bleak and desert-like country which you can imagine we had turned to the north of the beaten track in the hope of coming upon a new field not taken up by the old-time and experienced prospectors who overran like the locusts of egypt we camped upon the confines of a small creek the only one in that part of the country day after day was spent in vain attempts to find a trace of gold but so profound was our ignorance of mining that our ill success was no proof of the absence of the precious metal a few miles to the north of the camp the sand plains terminated in a series of hills almost mountains this region we carefully avoided lest we should be lost in the hills as a last resort we decided to explore the foothills taking care to keep our camp continually in sight to avoid fatigue we placed part of our supplies on the mule and with the tent advanced to the range which proved to be well watered much to our surprise none of the water coming down to the plain it being sucked up by the sand in a short distance our search was fruitless, and we had determined to abandon our quest and return to Coolgardie, when the following remarkable circumstances transpired. In consequence of Vale's youth and lack of strength, we had made a division of the work. 
he took charge of the culinary department while the hard labor fell to my lot but for his skill in this particular i should have abandoned the search in two weeks given the most common materials he could be relied upon to prepare an excellent meal one day while i was absent in the hills he found in the neighborhood of the camp a small piece of opal which evidently had recently been broken from its bed in the rock as the fracture was new and bright our conclusion was that we must have a neighbor but why he had not made his appearance known we could not conjecture there was but one interpretation to be placed upon his desire to remain concealed and that was that he had hit upon a new field and was working it we had never heard it stated that opals were found in the colony but australia is a land where one is not surprised at any mineral discoveries on the island were gold silver copper iron tin diamonds and in queensland opals we resolved to prolong our stay and if possible discover the more fortunate prospector we made a careful examination of the hills for traces and soon discovered them on the fourth day we came upon a hut built in a secluded ravine wherein we found an old man who gave his name as burton and stated that he had been in the country for months but had not succeeded in finding any gold from that time an intimacy sprang up between us but we found the old man extremely reticent relative to his past life originally he had resided in sydney then in melbourne and finally had removed to the west coast he was exceedingly feeble and ill-fitted to cope with such a life of hardships from the first he conceived a strong partiality for vale who never tired in treating him to delicacies of his own making over the campfire we acted on hints given by our new friend who evidently possessed a good knowledge of mining but were not rewarded for our perseverance at the end of two weeks the old man fell ill and we removed him on the mule to our camp where he could be made much more comfortable gradually he grew feebler there was no disease but a general breaking up of the system which indicated but too clearly that the end was drawing near to my surprise he manifested a strong desire to be left alone with vale in the camp they spent many hours in whispered conversations which excited my curiosity but not a word fell from their lips which gave me a clue to the mystery for mystery there undoubtedly was one night the old man was very low when he summoned me to his side and vale went outside the old man said i have made a wonderful discovery what it is i cannot tell you it is possible that you may make the same discovery i cannot understand why you have not made it long since i want you to promise a dying man that should you make the discovery before you return to coolgardie that you will conduct yourself as an honourable man and an englishman i gave my promise and an hour later the old man breathed his last the grief of vale was so intense and poignant that i was still more mystified though i knew that he loved the stranger dearly the grave was dug beneath a flowering wattle and vale in a low sweet voice broken by sobs read a chapter from the testament as the last burial rite the following day i proposed that we set out on our return trip i have a secret vale answered which if you can unravel may result in the betterment of our fortunes the old man strove in vain to solve it and his life paid the forfeit it was for that he came into this colony and not for gold i have given the old man my word of honour that i will not profit by the discovery if i should make it i answered an embarrassed look spread over my companion's face and to my surprise his eyes filled with tears bear in mind i continued if it will benefit you anything in my power will be freely done and you can rely upon me to the last i know it i know it vale answered fortunately your pledge in no way applies to the subject to which i refer do not deceive me i said hotly for a moment i doubted him a man's honour is not to be bartered for gold i pledge you my word was the answer and i value your honour as highly as you do yourself i grasped him by the hand and we were friends again what could it all mean 
I was gravitating from mystery to mystery, and not a ray of light to guide me. I have the riddle in my pocket, Vail continued. Perhaps you can read it. He drew out a piece of paper, yellow with age, on which had been traced with a pen some rough outlines. Vail spread the paper out with a careful hand and said, This is supposed to be a map of this part of the country. The white paper represents the flat or sand country, that is, the plain, the small crosses, the hills. This circle, a marsh, lagoon, or pond in the rainy season, and the square, an island of dry land in the center of the marsh, the three small dots on the island, three gum trees growing only a few feet from each other, and what is to be remembered is that the gum trees all lean toward a common center. If you can find the island and the gum trees, there is every reason to believe that our fortune is made. Years since, a convict buried under the gum trees a magnificent band of Queensland opals. I started and exclaimed, Some of the opals of which you found a small piece? Yes. And the old man came here to look for it? He did. And confided the secret to you? Yes. We must find it. Well, certainly. And we begin the search tomorrow. I am agreed. I was consumed with curiosity, but did not attempt to pry into the mystery, as Vale did not volunteer any further information. My experience in the back blocks had taught me that to succeed we must proceed in a methodical manner. I studied the map carefully, and concluded from the crosses representing the hills that the marsh could not be inland from the plain more than five miles, and that all that was necessary was to go in that distance, using the compass, then move over half a mile at right angles and come out to the plain. This system, repeated over and over again, would cover the whole area, and must in the end prove successful. Vail agreed with my conclusion, and that night we went to bed, confident that the prize was ours. The following morning we set out, taking the mule with us to carry two days' provisions, and incidentally to give Vail a lift when he grew weary, for I realized that his strength would soon give out on such a march, though I refrained from mentioning that part of the program to him, for he was exceedingly sensitive on that point day after day we toiled over the hills but caught sight of no lagoon it was the height of the hot season and a great drought was upon the land i had learned enough of this strange country to know that we were confronted with great difficulties as the rainy season would transform the entire country where now were only barren stretches would be great sheets of water or broad and fertile plains covered with waving grass a week passed, and at heart I was utterly discouraged, but Vail never grew despondent. But for him I should have abandoned the quest. His courage never faltered, it was only a question of time, and we would succeed. In two weeks nature drove us from the field, every stream and lagoon in the hills dried up, and at our camp the water was running very low. I felt that it was dangerous for us to remain any longer, and urged the necessity of our departure upon my companion. He pleaded for delay, but could furnish no reasons of any weight. To my surprise I found that under his gentleness was a firmness much greater than my own. In those trying days I used the word stubborn. One Sunday Vail reluctantly consented that we should take up our march to the south on the following day. My spirits rose at the prospect, but Vail was depressed and wandered aimlessly along the first range of foothills. I was up bright and early, making up the packs, when Vail went down to the water hole for a supply with which to cook the breakfast. He came back with astonishment written all over his face. "'Come down here!' he cried, seizing me by the arm. I hurried down. Imagine my surprise when I saw oozing from the parched ground, which, owing to the intense heat, had cracked in a thousand places, opening to a depth of five or six feet in some spots, the water clear and sparkling. "'What does it mean?' he asked in a whisper. "'It has rained on the higher ground,' I answered. "'Rained? Who ever heard of it raining at this season in West Australia?' I was compelled to acknowledge that I never had. 
you may as well unpack vail said there can be no danger on the score of water i had no answer to this and grumbling i untied the packs and ate my breakfast in moody silence i could see that vail was watching and that while he regretted my disappointment he was equally determined to have his own way that day we walked up among the hills and found the water bursting out of the ground in numberless places we knew that it had not rained the coming of the water was so strange and unaccountable that i was compelled to confess that i was unable to find any reasonable explanation on the other hand vail regarded the outflow as an intervention of providence on our behalf we waited for several days until the low-lying places were filled with water and then began our search again not three miles from the camp we came upon a low plain which we had repeatedly crossed in the dry time but never for a moment had we associated it with the hidden opals simultaneously we stopped and vail pointed to the higher ground in the centre now surrounded by a sheet of water only about a foot deep but constantly rising we waded across and in half an hour had located the blue gum trees which answered the description laid down on the map then we hurried to the camp and returned with picks and shovels and began digging the ground was very hard and our progress slow evening was coming on but such was our impatience that we resolved to continue the work the moon came up and by its dim light we toiled steadily at last we struck ground that was not so compact this encouraged us and we sank our pick at that point perpendicular at the depth of five feet we unearthed a small wooden box we burst off the cover and in the pale moonlight saw five bands of opal more beautiful than anything we had ever dreamed of each band was fully four inches in breadth and about eighteen inches long hurrah shouted vail trembling with excitement we started for the camp crossed the lagoon and entered a thick piece of scrub to take a short cut i heard not the slightest sound suddenly something stung me in the calf of the leg the pain was intense and i cried out i have been bitten by a snake i put my hand down and found and said that a small spear was sticking in my leg my presence of mind returned instantly and i whispered down on the ground quick and crawl into the bush to the right i could feel the blood trickling from the wound and hurriedly bound it up with my handkerchief vail crouched by my side and was trembling violently fortunately our revolvers were in our belts and we drew them and waited and listened the silence was oppressive and every minute seemed a half hour all that could be heard was the beating of our hearts my loss of blood must have been great for i whispered to vail i am growing faint he put his arm about me and asked shall we venture it no we are in an ambush and shall be speared if we move the next instant half a dozen spears sped through the air over our heads and thrashed through the brushwood we flung ourselves prone on the ground and waited all was silent again then i fainted from loss of blood ere i lost consciousness i had a faint impression that tears were dropping on my face when i regained consciousness i found that another handkerchief had been bound around my leg above the wound and a small stick passed beneath it and then twisted until the handkerchief had been pressed into the flesh thus stopping the flow of blood and probably saving my life there we lay hour after hour till at last the welcome dawn came creeping in through the haze i was too weak to sit up and remembering vail's fright when the attack was made gave up all hope with the daylight our position would become known to the natives and in a few minutes all would be over when i looked around vail was nowhere to be seen i cursed him for a coward and half struggled to my feet then there rang out the sharp report of a revolver followed by shot after shot in rapid succession the boy was making it exceedingly hot for them i put my hand to my belt my revolver was gone this accounted for the number of shots which had been fired then followed a pause and another volley of shots he had reloaded and reopened the battle 
a little later he dashed up the path to my side a revolver in each hand and cried all that are not dead have run away we must get to the camp he helped me to my feet but i could not touch the wounded foot to the ground leaning on his shoulder and hobbling forward we at last reached the open there my strength gave out Veo propped me up with my back to a boulder and bathed my forehead with some water and gave me a drink good luck he cried there is the mule which we had hobbled and left in the vicinity of the camp a few minutes later i was on its back and soon reached the tent it was impossible for me to go forward but the natives had paid too dearly for their attack to return and undoubtedly left that part of the country for we saw no more of them vale explained that when he saw that daylight was coming on he decided that the only way to save our lives was to creep out and make a rear attack upon the savages thus creating the impression that they had been attacked by a rescuing party the ruse had proved successful and resulted in the death of three natives and the wounding of several others beyond a doubt i owe my life to the skill and forethought of my companion the wound in my leg healed slowly and was exceedingly painful two weeks passed before i was able to set out for coolgardie which we reached without further incident from coolgardie we journeyed to perth at the capital we met a french expert who paid us four thousand pounds for the box of opals which i have since learned was much less than the market value of the gems the money was equally divided and i was preparing to return to england when vale made a request which i felt i could not refuse it was that i should remain in perth for one month during his absence he would meet me at the imperial hotel on the first day of the following month at eight p m i opined that the request was connected with the promise which i had given to the old man at the camp and anxiously awaited the denouement so anxious was i that there should be no delay that i took up my residence at the hotel a week previous to the termination of the time the last day i carefully scrutinized all newcomers but saw nothing of my friend when eight struck i abandoned all hope and grew anxious lest some accident had befallen him on the stroke of the clock a bell-boy came down the stairs and informed me that a lady wished to see me in private parlour a so far as i was aware i was not acquainted with a lady in australia and i concluded that a mistake had been made the parlour was dimly lighted when i entered a young lady advanced from the window and said mr detmold i believe i answered in the affirmative be seated please the voice was exceedingly sweet and musical and awakened memories but in vain did i attempt to recall when or where i had heard it there could be no doubt but that england was the place and i awaited impatiently a clue to the explanation i have learned the lady continued that you made a trip into the interior with a very dear friend of mine george vale and that you both returned to perth where a handsome sum was received for the sale of a large package of opals you will pardon me for my frankness but i am deeply interested in mr vale i heard an audible sigh and mentally registered the conviction that vale was a deucedly lucky fellow for the woman was exceedingly attractive if not beautiful and so far as i could see possessed a figure of exquisite proportions your statement in reference to vale and myself is true i answered and any information which i possess will be freely furnished uh, thanks will you kindly furnish me with mr vale's address unfortunately i am unable to do so he left me in perth one month ago to-day and was to meet me at this hotel at eight o'clock this evening in fact i was waiting for him when i received the message from you a remarkable coincidence she murmured with a perceptible shade of doubt in the tone which irritated me another question where did mr vale go from perth i have not the slightest idea he mentioned no place merely stated that he would meet you in one month yes who beside mr vale and the purchaser was cognizant of the fact that you had sold the opals and received a handsome sum for them 
no person the purchaser requested that no mention should be made of the transaction alleging that if it became known that such a large quantity of opals had been thrown on the market it would depreciate the value of the gems what became of the purchaser may i ask he left the following day for albany and informed us that it was his intention to proceed to sydney and take the first messageres steamer for france then it follows that you were the only person remaining in the colony who was aware that vale had been paid a large sum of money the only person may i ask what was the sum two thousand pounds and you received an equal amount one more inquiry and i have finished i have never heard that opals were found in west australia did you discover an opal mine for the first time i hesitated i could feel that i was being closely watched by my fair questioner and an uneasy feeling crept over me was i free to explain the circumstances under which the opals came into our possession i was well aware of the old superstition that opals were unlucky and it was possible that our gems possessed this peculiarity you have not answered my question mr detmold no i was considering the opals came into our hands in a very remarkable manner and i do not know whether i should be justified in divulging the facts without vale's consent as it was through him that they were discovered i may be frank with you mr detmold and thus remove your doubts from my infancy i have been the constant companion of mr vale he is my dearest friend and i feel a deeper interest in him than in any other person i am convinced that were george present he would under the circumstances ask you to speak unreservedly what more could a lady say she referred to him as george quite unconsciously there could no longer be any doubt as to their relations and as i glanced at her i forgot my momentary irritation and envied the lucky fellow when i told her the story of the finding of the box of vale's tact and bravery and my admiration for the man as i proceeded her face flushed and a new light came into her eyes she paused a little time to recover her composure and then said what you have told me is very wonderful have you the map of the ground where the opals were found no vale took it with him all of your statements have been direct but unfortunately for you there is not the slightest evidence to corroborate them no only my word permit me to point out the facts she continued you go into the interior with mr vale you find four thousand pounds worth of opals under very peculiar circumstances you return and dispose of them and on the day the sale is made vale disappears and since that day he has not been seen or heard from i may tell you that it is known that he did not leave perth by any of the coast steamers he did not proceed to albany and take passage on one of the european steamers which call at that port there is no trace of his having gone to coolgardie or to any other point in the interior what has become of him i would give my share of the money gladly to know i answered now thoroughly alarmed if i am compelled to apply to the police they will undoubtedly ask your assistance then it dawned upon me that in stating the facts i had woven a net of suspicion around myself could it be possible that i was already in the hands of a female detective my blood ran cold but a few weeks previous deeming the murderer had been arrested in the interior and taken to melbourne public feeling ran high in the colony and justice ran a swift race conscious of my innocence my courage rose and rising i said my advice is that you at once report the matter to the police and my advice is said the lady also rising that you henry detmold are a great goose i stared in amazement what could it all mean oh it may be so i answered stiffly you came here to meet george vale i most certainly did and you don't know him when you see him was my brain failing i advanced to my persecutor and instantly it flashed upon me i threw my arms around the girl and carried her up to the light there was no mistake it was george vale 
he struggled to get free but i held him fast you humbug i cried even now when i know you you look pretty enough to kiss do you think so yes and remembering that he had kissed me when i lay in a half faint i stooped down and kissed him on the cheek blushing as i did so but george's blushes were carnation compared with mine and i set him down on his feet what a stupid he said oh i quite agree with you and you don't understand yet understand what that that i am a girl a girl yes and always have been i blundered out in my blunt way the only answer was a merry ringing laugh yes and always have been then i am doubly glad i kissed you you held me no matter tell me i am dying of impatience you made a promise to the old man did you not yes and i think i understand he must have known the secret how did he discover it he knew immediately and accused me and i confessed and i was stupid you did not find me out who are you helen vale i am glad that i have only lost one half of my old partner you are at least vale then helen told me her story her father had been an english half-pay officer who on his retirement from the army had emigrated to sydney in the hope of bettering his condition his wife having died the first year after his removal to the colony his health had failed and as helen was the only child her life had been devoted to his care they had no surviving relatives so far as she was aware and when her father died a few months previous to my meeting her at coolgardie his sudden death had thrown her penniless on the world as his pension ceased with his life after the small debts and the funeral expenses had been paid there only remained some fifty pounds with which to face the world she had proceeded to melbourne and in vain attempted to secure employment as a governess but her youth and inexperience had proved an insuperable stumbling-block and as a final resort she had resolved to go to the gold-fields of west australia and to facilitate her project and chances of success she had donned a man's dress and made her way to coolgardie her timidity and the roughness of the miners had prevented her from engaging in any enterprise and but for my arrival and friendship she would have been compelled to acknowledge her sex and obtain menial employment when she had concluded i said the natives found you an excellent shot even if you are a girl yes my poor father taught me the use of the revolver when i was a little girl and that gave me confidence and taught me the tactics for i had frequently heard him give his experience of adventures among the hill tribes in india where he was stationed for many years after we came to perth why did you retire for a month and why did you lead me through such a maze before you made yourself known i had to secure a wardrobe and to remove the tan from my face and then i wished to ascertain whether you would recognize me in my new apparel where did you hide i went to the convent and the good sisters took me in and were very kind to me though the lady superioress made me many lectures on the enormity of my sin and extracted from me a solemn promise that i would never again commit the offence there is one more mystery which i should like to have cleared up it is how did the old man become possessed of the secret that a box of opals had been buried on the island in the lagoon for many many years he was a squatter in queensland so long ago that the penal system was in vogue in that and the other colonies he had on his station at one time a ticket of leave man by the name of vigor whom he treated very kindly vigor had been transported for forgery and was intelligent and had been educated as a mining engineer he was a lifer and the one object of his life was to return to england where he had a wife and family the old man won his gratitude by attempting to secure a pardon for him from the authorities at sydney but his efforts were fruitless vigor who acted as a shepherd on the run found the opal mine but kept the secret to himself 
he dug out the opals found by us and made his escape to sydney where he hoped to obtain passage to england but failed he was finally captured and sent to norfolk island from which place he was transferred to west australia the opals he had buried in sydney on his return to sydney he dug them up and carried them with him to the west coast at perth as a ticket of leave man he went into the service of a squatter he wrote a letter to his old master in queensland telling him that he possessed the treasure and that if he did not succeed in getting away from the colony he would bequeath it to him on his death sending at the same time the sample which i found vigor kept an accurate account of the journey into the interior in search of pasture and made a map of the route as well as of the spot where he ultimately buried the opals vigor and his companions made their way to the coast but he was so enfeebled in consequence of the hardships he had undergone that he died in a few months after his return previous to his death he sent to his old employer the map by which we located the treasure the old man had no faith that he would be able to find the opals and years passed by the great drought in queensland ruined him and as a last resort he came to perth and set out on his search encouraged by the fact that the gold miners were pouring into the interior you know the rest and his unfortunate death at our camp when he ascertained that i was a girl and had heard my story his heart went out to me and he gave me the treasure provided i could find it and you divided it with me that was only fair yes if you had been a man but as you are not you must take my part less the few pounds which i have spent never exclaimed helen with tears coming to her eyes i had loved vale as a boy as a girl i worshipped my old partner and the result was that within one week we were married and are now on our way to the illawarra district where i propose buying a small station and settling down for life some time in the future my partner and i will go to queensland and on the run of the old man which is on the barku attempt to locate the original opal mine eighteen months later i was not surprised when i read in the sydney morning herald that a very rich deposit of opals had been discovered on the barku by a man named detmold end of story one story two of kafer kangaroo klondike tales of the gold fields by thaddeus william henry levitt this librivox recording is in the public domain story two the black cat of klondike in the winter of eighteen ninety six i was attending the osgood hall law school toronto and drawing wills deeds and mortgages for a firm of barristers on a salary of five dollars per week i was young and ambitious and dreamed that it was only a question of time when i should become if not a judge at least a leading barrister at a conversat given by the law society i met my fate and fell in love with edith hathaway the passion was reciprocated and a few weeks later we were engaged when the marriage would take place was delightfully nebulous as was my legal status we had decided that it was to be and that was all sufficient one caution we exercised and but one it was we kept the engagement a secret edith's father was a broker living in a fine residence on fashionable st george street and reputed to be in very comfortable circumstances possibly he might object to the betrothal of his only child to an impecunious law student who had only passed his first exam and was by no means certain of passing the next one so we drifted pleasantly with the tide and cherished our secret with infinite satisfaction one saturday afternoon i received a hurried note from edith asking me to call that evening instinctively i felt that our mutual happiness was threatened i was busy engrossing a mortgage at the time and unconsciously i made all the sums payable to edith hawthaway instead of isaac lazarus i found edith in tears we must part she cried all is over no no i said it cannot be i was so happy and now the cruelty of fate 
calm yourself and tell me all we shall never part come what may we are ruined she sobbed my father my poor father risked everything in chicago and he has lost home money everything must go and yet there will remain a debt of honor for twenty thousand dollars this money was entrusted to him by a widow it was her all the shock was more than he could bear he has had a paralytic stroke and the doctors say he will never recover he may live for years but will be helpless mother as you know is an invalid and she paused and wiped away her tears how can i tell you but i must only yesterday fred rheingold asked me to be his wife he knows all and yet he declares that if i will consent the old home shall be saved and the debt of honor paid what am i to do in one year we shall be turned into the street mother has a few hundred dollars we can subsist upon it for a year by discharging all the servants and living with the greatest economy then will come the poorhouse for father and mother and for me god only knows some way will open i murmured what way i was silent i have made up my mind edith said shuddering there is but one way for escape we must bury our love i must be sacrificed no i protested you do not you cannot love me edith turned deadly pale and gave me one look the cruel words died on my lips then we sat and brooded edith sprang to her feet and exclaimed i have it the one chance there was a ring in her voice from which hope was bred tell me name it i cried you will have to consent she said slowly as if weighing every word then i consent it is an inspiration she continued i will tell fred rheingold that i will marry him one year from to-morrow provided the twenty thousand dollars is not paid by that time you will have one year in which to make a fortune but will he consent to such terms yes if he loves me my hope sank to zero then froze i have not finished edith said she had divined my thoughts they have found great gold fields in the yukon it is a frightful country on the confines of alaska you must go there and find a fortune and be back in time but how i asked that shall be a secret until you come back i will see fred rheingold to-morrow and to-morrow night you shall know your fate the following evening she met me at the door and smiled it is all arranged she said the year has been granted you are to go when to-morrow morning on the first train but i never finished the sentence every hour means success or failure edith exclaimed reproachfully how that evening fled away we only realized when i kissed her good-bye she slipped three crisp one hundred dollar bills into my hand and then she whispered remember this is st patrick's day march the seventeenth and the time will expire at twelve o'clock at night one year from to-day i must give you something to bring you good luck what shall it be that which you love the best next to me she glanced around the room at her feet on a white rug lay a small black kitten there he is she said pointing to the kitten my second love i picked the kitten up inspired by a sudden impulse he shall keep me company i put him in my coat pocket and half an hour later i was packing my scanty wardrobe six days later i was standing on the quay at vancouver making inquiries for transportation to the yukon gold fields the man to whom i addressed the question was a rough burly fellow none too clean with a heavy beard covering his face up to his eyes his answer was what are you going to the yukon for to mine gold ah jim to another man who was loading some packages into a yawl jim come here do you see this spindle pointing to me here's a new chum who wants to go to the yukon and hunt for gold <laughs> look at him see them legs and hands <laughs> only another tenderfoot gone mad was jim's reply as he walked away i'm going to the yukon I said decidedly right you are my boy you may start but you'll never come back i've seen plenty of new chums on bendigo and yakandata they always talk big on the go in and cry on the come out 
What's that you've got in your pocket? A kitten. Is the kitten on the rush, too? He goes with me. Bless my eyes, Jim. This Slim has got a kitten going with him to the Klondike. No fear of them ever getting there, Jim responded. Boy, take my advice and go home to your mother, the man said in a kind tone. To be called a boy brought tears of vexation to my eyes. I turned to walk away. Hold on. You are determined to go? Yes. Have you money to pay for your passage and an outfit? Certainly. It will cost a hundred and fifty. I have it. Jim, the new chum, has the dust. Shall we take him? He will bring the party up to an even dozen and reduce the expenses. Your captain, do as you please. Anyway, the tenderfoot and the cat don't weigh more than a puffball, Jim answered. My name is Simeon, Simeon of Ballarat and Bendigo and Fiery Creek. This way sharp, if you mean business. See that schooner over there? We sail at four this afternoon. For an hour we were busy securing my outfit and provisions. When all were on board, we hoisted sail and were off. I had only fifty dollars left, and the kitten. The men were all experienced miners, some from Australia, the others from California, Nevada, and Colorado. When I took the kitten out of my pocket and fed him, there was a roar of laughter and a fusillade of remarks. They named the kitten Klondike, and ere we reached Dahlia, he had become a universal pet and the mascot of the party. It would have made Edith's heart glad to have seen the miners fondling Klondike. At Jaya we unloaded our supplies and hired the Indians to pack them over Chilcot Pass. At Lake Linderman a boat was built in which we floated down the Yukon. I could only make myself useful as cook, being totally unfitted for the hard work. Simeon counseled that we should not descend to Dawson City, but turn off and ascend a tributary at a point estimated to be from 100 to 150 miles from the city. The object aimed at was to discover a new field and locate the best claims. His advice was taken. We made our way up the creek until our progress was stopped by a series of rapids. There we pitched our tents. I was left in charge of the camp while prospecting parties went out in every direction. Gold was found in the beds of most of the streams, but not in paying quantities. Then the boat was hauled up the rapids with a rope we were to make a further advance into the interior. That night the boat broke loose, was swept over the rapids, and totally destroyed. Two of the miners went down to the Yukon to ascertain if they could get some boat which was descending the river to transport our supplies to Dawson City. They failed, but brought back the news of the wonderful strike made on the El Dorado. Instantly all was confusion. The men became mad. The mines were one hundred miles away. Packs were made up the following morning, a cache was built in which to store the provisions, and in twenty-four hours a start was made. The men each carried one hundred pounds of provisions, in addition to a pick and shovel. Simeon assisted to make up my pack of fifty pounds. The heat during the middle of the day was intense, the air filled with insect pests. The route ran over mountains, through bogs, across streams. In places the moss was two feet in depth. With my load I plunged and fell and ran, for the men marched at a rapid pace. Not ten miles had been covered when I fell exhausted. Not even for the coveted fortune for Edith could I have gone another mile. I was at the rear of the line and would have been left unheeded, but for the watchful care of Simeon, who came back and sat down by me. "'You can never go through,' he said. "'I knew that it was madness for you to try. You have done much better than I thought you would. Miners on a rush would leave their best friends to perish. I have been through it all before. I know what it means. If you would save your life, go back to the cash. There is plenty of provisions. You cannot starve. Go to work and build a hut. Dig a hole into the hillside so that the back and most of the sides will be of earth. Finish it with small logs. Put on a roof of poles. Cover them with moss. Then with a layer of earth. Then more moss and more earth. Make it thick. About a foot distant from the walls of the hut, 
build another row of logs and fill the space between with moss taking care to pack it tightly then plaster the cracks with mud be certain and have a big fireplace at the rear make it of stone and the chimney of green logs standing on end when you have these things done you will be safe but not till then i promise that i will come back for you but it may not be until spring here is my hand and john simeon never breaks his word cheer up we will probably have to return for provisions in a few weeks then you shall go through even if i have to carry you on my back he gave me a hearty handshake and turned and was gone i sank back on the moss and cried with a bitterness which i shall never feel again then a great fear came upon me for a moment i believe my heart ceased to beat could i find my way back every other question vanished i struggled to my feet and turned back with an energy born of despair every few minutes i stopped and examined the footmarks the sun had gone down but the night only lasts in that latitude in summer for one brief hour i was without a watch and could only guess the time at last i could proceed no further i threw off my pack and released Kondike from the little wicker cage i had made to carry him in and in ten minutes i was fast asleep when i awoke the sun was up but how long i slept i never knew i built a fire ate a hearty breakfast and started in half an hour i came to a point where two trails crossed which to take i did not know i went forward on one then turned back took the other and again turned back i was lost cold beads of sweat stood out on my body my brain beat like a trip hammer as i stood thus at the parting of the ways my eye caught sight of a fluff of cotton wool on a branch not five yards distant. i had lined klondike's basket with the material before leaving the camp saved by klondike i cried so bewildered was i that i should have passed the cache had it not have been for the cat he began to mew and cry to get out of his basket oh here we are at last i cried for four weeks i labored at the hut a miner would have built it in four days after three weeks i began to look for the return of my companions but at the end of six weeks i abandoned all hope the cold gradually increased i made everything tight and snug then i determined to prospect the nearby creeks for gold i found gold on every side but my best work did not exceed five dollars in a day klondike was my constant companion he had grown strong and agile and roamed about the camp at times going into the forest for hours the cold came down over the mountains and drove me into the hut i only ventured out to cut my supply of wood i fell into a despondent mood but for klondike i believe i should have gone mad with infinite patience i taught him a variety of tricks and there were times when i talked to him of edith and the happy days when he had nestled in her arms in such hours i imagined i saw her spirit looking out of his eyes and bidding me be of good cheer at night he crept into the fur-lined bag in which i slept and comforted me in the solitude with his purr in january i noticed that every afternoon he wished to leave the cabin and remain outside for nearly an hour as this continued day after day my curiosity was at last aroused and i determined to watch him which i did the following day leaving the hut he made his way diagonally up the hillside and then disappeared i resolved to ascertain the attraction i struggled into the snow which was piled twenty feet deep and sank to my waist then i took a shovel and commenced to dig my progress was exceedingly slow as i had to cut the snow down several feet before it would support me twenty feet per day was the best progress i could make klondike evidently believed that i was constructing the road for his convenience for when he daily returned from his mysterious visit he stopped and rubbed himself against my leg as if to encourage me in my good work on the fourth day i had reached a point where i could see the hole in the snow in which he disappeared it was on the top of a ledge of rock some ten feet wide to-morrow i said i shall know the reason 
that night i constructed a short ladder with which to surmount the difficulty the following day i placed it against the ledge and climbed up the crumbling snow running down the bank prevented me seeing what was before me i brushed the snow away and looked in at my very face was a skeleton hand holding a small black object in its bony fingers i screamed with terror the ladder lost its balance the next instant i was twenty feet below on my back in the snow i ran to the hut and actually barred the door so great was my fright what could it mean i had read of demons appearing in the guise of black cats a thousand grotesque fancies danced through my brain then i called klondike he was at my feet he could not possibly be in the skeleton hand and also klondike at the same time yet even that i imagined might be possible you must bear in mind that for months i had lived isolated from human companionship that my brain had become warped and my thoughts abnormal was the skeleton hand a warning should i abandon the quest and leave a mystery unsolved perhaps it was a portend of my fate thus i reasoned and surmised conjured and imagined my one consolation was that klondike had crept into his accustomed place and was apparently sleeping the sleep of innocence unmindful of the skeleton hand when the sun came up over the mountains the next day my courage returned i determined to probe the affair to the bottom to prove that there was nothing supernatural about the cat i took klondike in my arms and made my way to the top of the ladder the hand was there and the cat was there he sprang from me and entered the opening coming out again with a bone in its mouth the forearm of a man only the last resting place of some poor miner who has died in the wilderness was my comment then for the first i noticed that the object in the grasp of the skeleton hand was a small book i reached out and tried to remove it from the bony fingers they held it in a death grip and i was compelled to pick up the hand which i carried to my cabin i pried open the fingers and opened the book the fly-leaf was closely written over in a language which i was unable to read the book printed in a fine small black type was equally unreadable from the chapters and for other reasons i decided that it was a copy of the new testament i carefully wiped it and laid it away on a shelf to-morrow i said i will close the opening the stranger's bones shall rest in peace the next day provided with pick and shovel i climbed the ledge and carefully removed the snow then i knelt down and looked in the cavern was some three feet in height and eight in length the small bones were strewn about but the trunk remained prone upon the centre of the cavern suddenly something soft touched me on the face i sprang back lost my balance and for the second time found myself on my back in the trench below i scrambled to my feet and ran for the hut then i stopped and turned klondike was sitting complacently on the top of the ladder now i will be a man i said and i walked back heartily ashamed of myself i took my tormentor to the hut fastened him in and returned i resolved to replace all of the scattered bones and seal up the mouth of the cave to do so i was compelled to crawl inside in my task i chanced to move the trunk the sun shot a beam of light within and reflected a dull yellow glitter there could be no mistake it was gold then i paused should i take it or bury it with the bones it had been his in life why not in death if simeon did not return i too would be found some day my bones bleaching beside my handful of yellow dust no i would leave it with its rightful owner carefully i gathered the bones they were sacred to the memory of the unknown edith's love hope and avarice all were but memories as long past as if ages had gone by then it came upon me that a trust had been committed to my charge the dying man had left a message a sacred injunction written in god's book the handful of gold was to be sent to some loved one instantly all my sympathies were aroused 
i had something to live for to work for i felt like a new man i went back to the hut and brought with me a small tin dish in which to gather the last grain i picked up the nuggets one by one so intent was i that it was not until the pannikin was half full that i noticed that the supply was by no means exhausted i went for another and larger dish and another and another and still more remained night came on and i was compelled to relinquish my task the cabin had been transformed into a treasure house a demon whispered in my ear you are rich edith and love and happiness are before you fool you have but to reach out your hand and take the gold dead men tell no tales a violent trembling seized upon me my resolution wavered then my eye rested upon the little black book and a great calm fell upon me no i said it is not mine i will not be a thief from that moment i was firm and i never doubted but that providence would rescue me from the yukon when i had removed all the treasure i closed the mouth of the cave then i fashioned a rude cross and planted it firmly in the ground to mark the burial place my next step was to make forty small bags out of heavy cloth into which i poured the gold the bags i buried in the hut beneath my bed the possession of the treasure brought a new fear that of robbers yet so far as i knew there was not a man within one hundred miles of me i frequently awoke in the night and listened intently believing that i heard footsteps one night i suddenly sprang to my feet at the very door were snarling and fighting dogs then followed a thump on the side of the hut hello hello are you there came in a hoarse voice who are you i asked open the door new chum it was simeon i gave a shout rushed out and fairly hugged him with joy and jim too who was unharnessing the dogs and here klondike's grown as big as a tiger simeon cried picking up the cat have you any grub plenty boil the billy and make tea is any of the brandy left well i never touched it the best news yet knock the neck off a bottle jim brandy jim was in the hut in an instant after justice had been more than done to the meal simeon after looking around said well done for a boy had a long wait eh? i always thought you would come hear that jim no one doubts the old man's word that's better than gold i would have been back in a month but we got word from a party who came down from this section that you had left and that the cash had been robbed it must have been another camp had many visitors looking for food and stealing what you did not give i have not seen a man since we parted in the woods good heavens why hundreds and hundreds have gone down the river and you did not know enough to make for the big stream get taken on board and find yourself in dawson city in two days no i told you jim that being a new chum he'd sit down as long as the grub held out did you mine any gold a little show it i handed him the buckskin bag which held the gold i had mined twenty ounces enough to take you home how did you succeed i asked struck it rich took out twenty five thousand dollars worth jim twenty thousand and the rest of the party about the same and we have only scratched over our claims the dust is down at the city when shall we make a start i asked in the morning then we turned in for sleep at an early hour jim was busy loading the sleds with supplies i'm blessed if you have eaten as much as a canary bird he remarked to me the boys will have to run up and bring down the rest i had purposely said nothing of my wonderful experience waiting until i could tell simeon privately which i did showing him the skeleton hand and the black book in confirmation i don't know where you picked up these things he said but one thing is certain you are off your chump but i have the gold where buried here take the pick and dig it up what do you say to that i asked as i pulled out a bag and that and that and that jim we are a fine lot of duffers come in this new chum and the cat mind you the cat have beaten every man on the bonanza and el dorado jim came in and stared he could not speak and then he whispered how many has he got 
only forty bags but the gold is not mine i said not yours then whose is it the dead man's and you will not keep it no if the book contains a will and you are a lawyer's clerk i could not keep it i repeated firmly simeon turned me around and around and then said i believe you if you live you will make a man you have got the timber in you shake the gold was carried out and loaded on a sled while i put klondike in a bag we reached dawson city and after some weeks delay secured a steamer for st michael's from that point we sailed to vancouver at the latter place i ascertained that the value of the find was one hundred and ninety five thousand dollars the dust was deposited in the bank of montreal then simeon and i went in quest of a man who could read the writing in the black book at last an officer from a russian man-of-war was found he translated the message here is the translation my name is vosper plonvinsky i was born in warsaw of noble polish parents the russian authorities arrested me as a member of a secret society and banished me to siberia there i remained for twenty years again and again the black knot cat in english cut my flesh to the bone for trying to escape finally i made my way to sea in an open boat and reached alaska the accursed russian was there i was seized on suspicion and sent into the interior to look for mines with several officials our voyage was up a great river one night i stole the boat which was well supplied with provisions and firearms and sailed away up the river after several weeks i came to the rapids where i abandoned the boat then i packed my provisions into the interior keeping to the west my intention was to make my way to canada when i reached a small stream near this spot i found a small stream the bed of which was yellow with gold i resolved to gather a vast store hide it and then proceed on my way after i had collected the gold i hid it in the cave where my bones rest then my last sickness came upon me i grew weaker day by day i realize that i am dying my last act is to write this and creep into the cave i make a solemn vow it is if a russian should find me and touch me or my gold i swear by the memory of the black knout cat that i will return and curse him and his children and his children's children to the man of any other nation the gold is a free gift i sold the gold to the bank and handed a check for five thousand dollars to simeon not a cent he said i have enough and to spare then i gave him five hundred to hand to jim one week later i was in toronto it was saturday night when i arrived when the cab drew up at edith's home i saw that the drawing-room was a blaze of light then my heart sank i had not had a word from her since i left on the quest i felt that she had broken her promise to me and married fred rheingold with a trembling hand i rang the bell i ignored the servant and walked in with klondike in my arms the next instant edith was in my arms her first words were did you get any of the letters or telegrams not one did you see the notices in the newspapers no what notices notices for you to come back father did not lose his fortune it was a mistake in the telegram from chicago the margin was on the right side and all was explained when the broker wrote father nearly recovered and is very well what of fred rheingold i stammered married six months ago to bessie loudon i have got the gold i said and we don't want it edith answered in our library under a glass case stands the skeleton hand holding the greek testament now and then i point out this hand to the new baby whose name is simeon end of story two Story three of Kafer Kangaroo Klondike Tales of the Gold Fields by Thaddeus William Henry Levitt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story three The Skeleton Mine A Tale of South Africa. 
i was one of the first prospectors in the transvaal to search for gold and a precious dance it led me at that time but few englishmen had ventured into the boer country and such was the jealousy with which they were regarded that it was impossible to secure any information which would assist in the search footsore and weary i tramped from farm to farm content to obtain a supper of mealies and the toughest of tough south african mutton there were rumors on every hand that gold existed but to locate it was quite another matter it has since transpired that in my wanderings i passed over some of the richest gold-bearing deposits in the world but so unlike the gold-bearing fields of california and australia is the rand that the most experienced miner would never have dreamed of the richness of the claims i was not searching for quartz but the poor man's field placer mines to add to my perplexities my money ran short and i could only replenish my purse at cape town i sank so low that i was compelled to sell my horse and from that hour i was on a level with a kaffir in the estimation of the boers the white man who approaches a farmhouse in the transvaal on foot must be prepared for abject humiliation fortunately i had acquired some knowledge of sheep in australia else i believe that i should have starved when all else failed i became a sheep doctor and vended a compound whose virtues would have done credit to the most widely advertised patent medicine nostrum one long to be remembered evening i arrived at a boar's house situated twenty miles from any other habitation when i asked for supper and a night's lodging the door was slammed in my face and in the worst of german i was ordered to be gone physically i was incapable of complying with the command and mentally i had not the slightest intention of departing in an outhouse devoted to storing mealies sheepskins and harness an old man was sitting on the doorstep compounding a mixture which i recognized as a sheep remedy i approached him and gave him to understand that i was possessed of a remedy which would work wonders in such cases he was all attention instantly and the result was that in a few minutes an excellent meal was spread in the house to which i was invited then i proceeded to mix a number of simples which the man possessed and finally i poured into the simmering mass with the greatest care and ostentation a few grains of boracic acid which i fortunately possessed the following day i was the most surprised man in south africa when i learned that my preparation was working a marvellous cure i was invited to remain with the boar the balance of the season as an honoured guest day after day i tramped the hills returning at night as wise and as rich as when i set out there were unmistakable indications that gold should be found in the vicinity but the stubborn fact remained that i could not find it i had given up all hopes and only remained to recruit my strength previous to setting out on my long journey to the coast when the following remarkable circumstances transpired i slept in a great four-poster bed of proportions ample for a race of giants and as i was deposited between two feather ticks in the old german fashion the weather being the reverse of cold my dreams were not the most pleasant and my rest not untroubled but for offending the good housewife i would have asked for a sheepskin on the floor one sultry night after a long day's walk i found myself tossing and restless and unable to get even a forty-wink nap for hours i thus lay lamenting my fate and regretting having abandoned the land of the golden fleece for the land of king solomon's mines at a late hour i fell into a disturbed sleep i awoke with a start and listened attentively all was quiet in the house and yet i felt certain that some one was preparing to leave the place how long this impression remained i am unable to say i am by no means certain that i again fell asleep and yet i am compelled by that which followed to acknowledge that it is probable that such was the fact whether dreaming or waking i saw a venerable old man dressed as a german peasant walk quietly out of the front door cast a suspicious glance around as if to ascertain whether he had been observed and then slip out into the darkness where he disappeared 
so realistic was the scene that the following morning i inquired whether a friend of the family had paid them a visit after i had retired the answer was no two nights later i saw precisely the same thing happen again but as on the former occasion i could not decide whether i had been dreaming or not the appearance of the venerable old man was indelibly stamped upon my brain i saw distinctly that he was very old that his beard was as white as a lamb's fleece and that he was dressed in an antiquated garb seen only in the most secluded parts of germany in which country i had spent several months attending a school in my boyhood days the next night i determined to remain awake but was not successful and again i saw the old man depart his constant reappearance had at last a powerful effect upon me i decided that the next time whether asleep or awake i would follow him with this resolve upon my mind i retired the next night and soon fell into a heavy sleep due no doubt to my former wakefulness once more i awoke or imagined that i awoke with the well-defined conviction that some person was preparing to leave the house cautiously i crept out of bed and as the old man left by the front door i slipped out by a side entrance i remember distinctly saying to myself this is certainly not a dream there is the man walking slowly over the belt and here i am watching and ready to follow where he may lead follow him i did my strange guide never once looked behind him after he had left the house but proceeded directly to the hills which ran along the north of the farm and were distant some two miles he gradually quickened his pace and finally i was compelled to run to keep him in sight after he entered the hills he turned and doubled on his track in the most provoking manner and frequently i not only lost sight of him but barely escaped meeting him face to face so sudden were his turns and so unexpected his reappearances why i was following him i could not tell in fact i was possessed of but a single impulse and that was to follow the old man never halted or hesitated but finally entered a narrow valley at the end of which rose a precipitous cliff at that point he suddenly disappeared when i reached the spot i found that beneath an overhanging rock an excavation had been made at some time in the past as there were no signs of recent work the pit was thickly strewn with fallen leaves and as it was but a few feet in depth i let myself down into it in the hope of discovering some passage by which the old man had disappeared my foot struck something which was evidently metal it proved to be an antiquated shovel with a short handle the night was a bright one and at the time the moonbeams streamed directly into the place i could discover no means of retreat save by the way i had entered and it was impossible for my strange guide to have returned by that route and passed me unnoticed unless he possessed the power of rendering himself invisible to probe the matter to the bottom i commenced digging the ground was exceedingly hard and my progress correspondingly slow i threw out several shovels of earth and then climbed up the bank and examined it i came upon a nugget worth at least five pounds then another and another but all smaller than the first all of my mining instincts were aroused and i forgot the strange circumstances under which i had been led to the mine again i entered the pit and set to work with all my energy and again i was handsomely rewarded the fever of greed seized upon me and i worked as if my life depended on the result the seventh time i began digging but the first thrust of the shovel brought it in contact with some hard substance i stooped down and found that i had uncovered the complete skeleton of a man an indescribable terror seized upon me i had been mining in a grave i am not superstitious but for the first i clearly realized the uncanny circumstances which surrounded my discovery i imagined that i heard vague whisperings in the air and that a rumbling sound came swelling up the valley i lost my presence of mind threw down the shovel and ran for my life i would have sworn that a legion of nameless fiends were at my very heels so insane was my fright when i emerged from the hills the moon was shining calmly and the sense of peace and repose brought me to my senses 
I walked rapidly to the farmhouse, which was in sight, crept in, and without undressing, threw myself on the bed. I was soon asleep, nor did I awake until the housewife called me to breakfast. When I discovered that I was dressed, I was amazed. I remembered distinctly going to bed the previous evening, but had no recollection of having got up during the night, until by chance I put my hand in my pocket and drew out one of the nuggets. Then it all came back to me with a vividness which was startling in its intensity. There could be no doubt of the mine, for the gold in my pockets was worth fully one hundred and fifty pounds. I resolved that I would keep my discovery a secret and continue to work the mine which had yielded such handsome results in a single night. Then I repaired to the hills and began my search. Half an hour convinced me that I retained not the slightest clue as to the location of the mine. Day after day I continued to search, but in vain. No trace of the valley could I discover, and finally I was compelled to admit that a doubt existed in my mind as to whether the gold had been found by me or had been placed in my pocket by some kind fairy. To have found and lost such an exceedingly rich deposit was exasperating in itself, but the uncertainty which enshrouded the whole business made me doubt my own sanity. One evening, as I was sitting in the house brooding over the problem, the boar's wife opened a great clothes press, removed several articles of wearing apparel, and laid them on the floor. My attention was immediately attracted to an old coat. "'Who owns the suit of clothes?' I inquired. "'They belong to Grandfather,' was the answer. "'Is he dead?' I queried. "'Dead more than twenty years. In fact, before I was married and came to live here, for he was my husband's father. Did you know him? Yes, but I was only a little girl at the time. Why have the clothes been kept? Before he died, he gave orders that they were not to be used, and his wishes have been respected. My husband has told me that he was a man of many peculiarities, and as it was due to him that we have the farm, we cherish his name and respect his wishes. What were his peculiarities? One was that he paid several visits to the Cape, and when he returned he always brought with him a bag of money, but to the day of his death even his son, my husband, did not know how he came to have it. With this money he bought land and cattle and sheep, and thus became rich. Had he lived he would have been the richest boar in this part of the country. Then his death was a mystery, and a mystery which has never been cleared up. He had grown to be old and feeble, and he did no more work, but nothing could keep him out of the hills. If any one followed him, he flew into a great passion and cursed him roundly. My husband feared that some accident would befall him in his wanderings, and the fear was at last realized. These clothes were his best, and he prized them very much, for he said that they had brought him good luck. It was for that reason he wanted them kept, no doubt. One day he went away to the hills, and he never came back. The whole country joined in the search, but no trace was ever found. He was not able to walk a long way, and could not have wandered any distance, and that was what made his disappearance the more strange. Some were of the opinion that he was carried off by the Kaffirs, some that he had been murdered, for it was well known that he always had gold in his pocket. Whatever befell him, no one knows." I took up the coat and hat, and could have sworn that the man I had followed to the hills was dressed in precisely the same garments. Could it be possible that after all these years I had found his grave? Had it been his ghost which I had seen night after night issuing from the house and making its way to the lonely grave in the hills? Had his wealth been derived from the sale of the gold which he had dug out of the pit? Admitting these facts, why had I been chosen to solve the mystery? Was it possible that a sympathy existed between the dead and gone boar miner and the needy prospector, myself? These questions I was unable to answer. My common sense revolted at such conclusions, and yet, argue as I would, the gold was in my pocket to prove their truth. There remained another explanation. It was that I had not been awake during the periods in which I saw the old man. I had developed into a somnambulist, 
and had got up in the night imagining that i was following an old man and while in that state picked up the gold found in my pocket in the morning unfortunately this theory did not account for the previous existence of my ghostly guide i realized the uselessness of attempting to explain to my boer friends the peculiar circumstances of the case and in consequence kept silent from that hour i abandoned my search for a mine which was alike a mine and a grave the location being only known to ghosts or somnambulists End of story three. Story four of Kafer Kangaroo Klondike Tales of the Gold Fields by Thaddeus William Henry Levitt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four A Maori Legend A New Zealand Story I spent a week in a pa down in the hot lake country, the King's Land, New Zealand, a short time before the destruction of the pink and white terraces one night as i lay in my thatched hut with the boiling water singing and simmering on every side an old maori wise man paid me a visit and told me the following story a thousand moons ago my people came over the sea in great canoes from the islands then the maori was like the white man of to-day restless as the wind ever roving to and fro from land to land the canoes came ashore down at the coast and it was beside these lakes that the paws were built because the fern root grew here in the warm damp earth and the great spirit made the water boil in which to cook it then our wise men said here is our home and this land was made for the maori here shall be found that which we so long have sought all would have been well if our people had listened to these words after a time there spread from ear to ear the story of a wonderful lake hid away up in the mountains no man could tell where the story came from for no man could be found who had ever seen the lake the mountains or the lakes or the boiling springs or the pink hills may have whispered it at night into some ear it may have been a dream but it came and at last that no man doubted it many a maori set out to find the wonderful lake and wandered among the mountains which grew blacker and blacker and higher and higher as he went on but one and all came back telling of great streams of jagged rocks of dark caverns but never catching a glimpse of the lake then our wise men held a council in the great paw and day by day they studied and thought at last it was decided that a venerable old man who had never eaten of human flesh should go forth alone into the mountains in quest of the lake much we wondered as he departed for with him he took only a staff and no fern root or anything to eat we bade him good-bye with sorrow in our hearts for we felt that we should never look upon his face again and that his bones would bleach upon the mountain side with no paw to cover them but there they would lie for all time to come a warning to men who went in search of the wonderful lake days went by and the wise man was given up for loss when he came down the mountain side and all of our people went out to meet him when they asked him if he had found the lake he bowed his head upon his breast and smiled and the people young and old gathered about him with many questions but answered he never a word one and all saw that a great change had come over him a mild light beamed in his eyes and a smile ever played about his lips kindness and sympathy covered him as with a mantle of sweet fern and all felt that he was good to look upon from him there went out a power for good never felt in maori land before and the people knew that to him had been given a sign which would lead them to happiness yet some there were who scoffed and said it was a trick of the wise men that he had been hidden in the hills and no good would come of it from that day the wise man went about doing good and to all he said there be three things eat not of human flesh help one another be content with your lot a few followed his counsel and found peace but the many went on their way blind in their own conceit 
the quiet of the valley and its simple fare were to them as bitter herbs they wandered away to other islands and over the land to the north and south they fought and ate each other and the message of the wise man became to them and to their children but a dream once a year at springtide when the moon was full the wise man left the paw with two young men and went into the mountains and to the lake each time they returned on the seventh day and from that day to the day of their deaths their faces shone as did the face of the wise man and they went about saying eat not of human flesh help one another be content with your lot what they saw what they heard at the lake no man knew year after year only three went out and returned at last the hour came when the old wise man fell sick and death sat by his side then he sent for my father's father who was an old man and to him confided the task of leading each year the young men into the mountains telling him also of the first visit and what would come of it this is the story which he told to my father's father i went into the mountains trusting that was all if for me to see the lake would be good for my people then i knew that the way would be pointed out so i journeyed on and on and though without food for the whole day i felt no hunger as night came near i descended into a valley in which plenty of ferns were growing and the water boiling in a small spring i gathered my fern roots and cooked them in the spring the next day i faced the mountains again i had gone but a little way when i saw before me an immense bird pluming itself on a shelving rock i had seen the skeletons of such birds many times but never a live bird before its plumage was dazzling white and its arched neck shone like the wattle in the sunshine its tufted head was more than twice the height of a man's head from the ground and although the bird was a long way off i felt that its eyes were soft and full of tenderness as i approached the white bird walked away stopping each minute to pick some green morsel for its stride was enormous and in the twinkling of an eye it could have mounted into the clouds hanging over the mountains all day long i followed the bird turning and twisting going forward and coming back again until i lost all reckoning of the paw but something whispered in my ear that it was to be at night i always found ferns for food and a hot spring so my wants were provided for on the third day out as night drew near i came very close to the bird almost close enough to touch it when it stepped through some great ferns with leaves of silvery whiteness such as i had never seen before and when i had followed it the bird had disappeared i raised my eyes and there at my feet was a circular lake girt about by immense mountains with cliffs rising from the water higher than twenty cowrie pines looking behind me the way i had come i saw the silver ferns but in the background a wall of rock through which no opening was visible much i wondered but feeling tired and hungry i gathered some of the ferns but no hot spring was at hand as before i stepped to the lake touched it with my hand it was almost boiling that night i slept beneath the silver ferns the next morning when i awoke there was no sign of the white bird but a little boat lay on the sand before me containing three seats and three paddles after eating some fern root i stepped into the boat and paddled out then for the first i saw that the lake contained a single island lying at its center but this island was not like any other island it had three equal sides on it was neither tree nor shrub i soon made my way to its shore there was only one landing place a narrow ledge upon which i drew up the boat by some natural steps i went up and found on the top a circular shallow basin full of boiling water the basin was formed of a dazzling white stone with alternate bands of a soft yellow which i had never seen before but which i now know the white man calls gold from the centre to the outside these bands ran round and round and it was only a question of time when they would cover the whole island 
a great attraction had the pool for me i sat down by its side and watched the blue water run over the rim and splash its way down to the lake leaving behind little bands of white and yellow and as i sat there the steam coming up in the centre sang a song in the maori tongue the song was eat not eat not eat not of human flesh help one help one help one another be content be content be content with your lot i knew that i was to tell these things to my people and i never forgot them then i lay down and fell asleep how long i slept i know not when i awoke the sun was gone and the great cross blazing in the sky and yet the pool sang the same song and the water ran over the rim and down into the lake once again i looked into the basin and then my heart grew still as i looked down i saw away and away a group of islands with a blue sea all around them running into little bays and long arms and under a part of one island was a great fire burning and sending up boiling water away out in the ocean i saw another island with an opening in the centre through which rushed flame and smoke this island was the chimney for the fires burning below me on which our paws were built on our islands i saw many maoris some good many bad with fierce fires burning in their hearts and the voice of the spring said behold your brothers but the day is near at hand and when great canoes will come over the waters with white wings and a white man will come to the canoes and in his heart burns still fiercer fires and he will make war upon you not with spears but with things which vomit fire and carry death a long way off he will kill the maoris and take the land and in a few years your people will be no more but to you is given a trust in the full moon once in the year bring hither two wise maoris and let their ears hear my song then shall they go to their brothers and speak the truth if your people listen one island shall be preserved for them and the black men shall not all die returning to the shore i found the moa standing by the bunch of ferns and following it for two days i was once more in sight of the pa there i told the story of the mysterious lake and the pool to the wise men and when the full moon came the next year three maoris went forth in quest of the lake they were guided by the white moa and they too heard the pool sing and saw into its depths season after season three men went and came and repeated the song of the pool the scoffers asked where are the white men with fire in their hearts and where are the big canoes with white wings and the ferns grew and faded into brown and rotted on the damp earth but at last the white man came and the wise men knew that the day was at hand with the white man came also wise men who while they pointed to the sky above and told us of the great spirit stole the land from under our feet and we saw that a great fire burned in their hearts but it was not the fire of war but a yellow flame which could only be quenched by a treasure they called gold these wise white men heard of the lake in the mountains and the pool with its yellow bands and much they searched the mountain but found it not then they heard of the journey of the three maoris each rainy season led by the white moa they watched and when the maoris set out they followed and thus it was that they found the lake three white men had followed the three maoris while the maoris were standing beside the lake the white men seized the boat and paddled as fast as they could to the island the moa stood on the shore and nodded its head up and down as much as to say you shall see two white men clambered on shore the other remaining in the boat once beside the pool the white men saw not its beauty they heard not the song for their eyes were filled with the yellow metal and their hearts with greed they were blind to the blue waters the purple mountains blind and deaf to all but gold then they set to work and dug up the yellow rim and the little channels over which the water ran and where once all was beauty and song and the whisper of the great spirit only desolation was left 
all day long they toiled and carried the gold and loaded it into the boat and so blind were they that they did not see that the boat grew no deeper in the water all day the moa nodded its head all day long the maoris wondered then a great sleep fell upon them the water in the lake was sinking down 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 carrying with it the little boat it sank away as silently as a bird in the air without a gurgle or a splash the fountain sang and flowed and the yellow bands ran out and down and over the two men binding them fast to the rock when they awoke they were pinned fast they writhed and twisted and screamed for their companion in the boat but he was a thousand feet below paddling paddling not to the island not to the shore but around and around then through the jagged rocks away below came a great roar as of a mighty river lashing itself into fury on the black stones when this sound fell on their ears they set up a pitiful cry which came over the lake to the maoris and made their hearts sad then the fire died out of the white men's hearts and the green leaves of the ferns where the maoris stood grew into wondrous beauty in their eyes and the plumage of the moas shone like burnished silver their cries for help died away in the rushing waters below the fountain stopped the blue water sank down to the black river leaving only a jagged hole crusted as far as they could see with gold but now they loathed the yellow metal and blamed it instead of their own hearts for all the evil which had come upon them out of the pool then came a faint blue wreath spreading about them embracing them and creeping like a cloud over the island then the hot steam gushed forth madly they writhed and gasped for breath but hotter and hotter grew the steam the sun went down and night came on under the green ferns the maoris lay down and slept when the sun came up the pool had ceased to vomit steam two skeletons on the island were bleached as white as snow on the mountain tops a skeleton in the boat with a skeleton paddle in his hands was paddling in a never-ending circle around and around the moa nodded its head and led the way back to the paw and from that day to this never a moa has been seen in new zealand amid the mountains lie the wonderful lake but it will never be found until the yellow fires have burned out of the hearts of the white men end of story four